Today's episode of the Bill Simmons Podcast on the Ringer Podcast Network. Brought to you by SeatGeek. That's our presenting sponsor. The easiest way to shop for the best tickets. Thanks to their revolutionary grading system. Football fans, I keep telling you, $20 off your first SeatGeek purchase on NFL tickets. Use promo code BSNFL. Download the SeatGeek app today or go right to SeatGeek.com. We're also brought to you by Gillette. Did you know a Gillette razor blade edge? is thinner than a single brain cell. Oh, it's true. That's the product of many brain cells at work, namely the thousands of men and women at Gillette, always working harder to make your shave better. And now you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. Gillette, the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. We are brought to you by TheRinger.com. That's where you can find my football slash mailbag column every Friday. And we're brought to you by The Rewatchables. That's our new movie podcast where we rewatch movies that we've already watched 40 times. Then we break them down. Last week, we did... What did we do last week, Tate? Silence of the Lambs, Silence of the Lambs. She big fat person. Oh, yeah. We broke that down. This week, we have Speed. That's coming up. It was an honorable mention. It wasn't a Hall of Famer, but it was an honorable mention. But... uh, It's a classic. It's a classic action movie. It's on all the time. And after tomorrow, you will know all my thoughts on speed because I have a lot of them. Anyway, the rewatchables. Check that one out. Don't forget to check out the Ringer NFL show, which is heated up with four podcasts a week, including two that are hosted by Tay Frazier and Mike Lombardi. One caveat on that podcast, we're putting the ones with Tate and Mike up on Sunday night, right after the games. You can get the kind of the instant takes. Good times all the way around. All right. Coming up, we have Nathan Fielder, Comedy Central star of Nathan For You. And then also Mike Lombardi, the aforementioned Lombardi. We're going to talk about anything we've learned after two weeks in the NFL. That's coming up around like the, the hour mark of this podcast. Right now, Nathan Fielder. But first, Pearl Jam. All right, Nathan Fielder is in the office. This is our third podcast. We've done two at Grantland, and then you disappeared. You were attacked by wolves, and nobody saw you for two years. What happened? Um, I was kind of waiting for you to restructure and get things get everything going ready to with go. the ringer. And <laughs> I then, really appreciate that. Yeah. I kind of have loyalty to you, so I wanted to make sure you were all settled. and Because I was also unsure if you know it was going to be good. Yeah, I don't blame you. Like, we weren't either. Grantland was so cool. Thank you. And like such a cool office in the ESPN building. And then, you know, and sometimes people will try things new and it fails. So I wanted to make sure it would be yeah. a success before, you know, attaching I've my name to it. I've had that happen too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 2013? Well, that's when <laughs> your show launched. Year? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think um, I was the first one on the bandwagon. You know, I you, had you on, on my podcast and n- nobody knew what the show was or who you were. I don't feel like. You were the first on the bandwagon. I think our first episode aired and you called up Lewis, who's I did. A publicist, my longtime friend. Right. And you were like, I want Nathan on the podcast. Yes. And at the time no one like knew what the show was. It wasn't even being like widely promoted or anything. It was not. And I also didn't know who you were. Yeah, because you're Canadian. I, I need to grow my Canadian o- audience. And I'm also not like a big sports. Right. But I did the podcast and then all these, like, it was like the most exposure. I ha- Like all these people were coming out of the woodworks and were like, I can't believe you were on Bill Simmons' podcast. Now, like, oh, wow. I didn't That's know nice to was, hear. Yeah, it was like a ton of people. That's great. People are more excited about that than the fact <laughs> that I made a, show. a sh- TV show. I swear. <laughs> it was really weird. But you I were saw the first. One. Yeah, I saw one. Did I know that you represented him, Lewis? I think you were like, this is my guy. And I saw one. I was like, what is this? I, I want to see all of these. 
And then I just had to, I just knew sometimes, you know, that was I'm great. wrong a lot, but sometimes, but what I was worried I about, I appreciate it so much. I think we even discussed this in the first podcast. I could tell how long it took for you to do eight episodes and how grueling it was. And that was my concern. I was like, I don't know if he can sustain this, you know, to pump out eight to 10 every 10 to 11 months. So you did well, you've done we, three seasons. W yeah, we've done three and the fourth starts this week. Right. Yeah. This start, it starts well, we're starting Thursday. This, this Thursday, we have an hour long special called Nathan for you, a celebration. I watched half then, of it. Oh, okay. Yeah. I Maybe. meant to watch all of it, but um, it, it's it a long story. Boring. No, there's yeah. some parent stuff. You, you, don't, you don't understand what it's like to have a 12 year old daughter. <laughs> there was some homework that needed to be helped, and then I was tired. And but I, I, you know, I got the gist of it, and I had already. It was nice to catch up with the characters. It's fine, yeah, and you can finish it any time. I, yeah, I, don't I figured feel. out time. So, anyways, that that episode is kind of like we follow up with people and yeah. stories from the show in the past and things that have happened behind the scenes since. And people kind of seemed eager to redeem themselves a little bit, just a tiny bit. Yeah. I guess there was a sense of that, especially the first guy, the, well, the host, well, the host, like the so really wanted to clear up the threesome. Yes. It's hosted by <laughs> Anthony Napoli, right. which, uh, for those who have seen the show, I did in season one, I did a fake dating show called yeah. The Hunk. And I was trying to like overcome my fear of uh, nervousness around women using kind of immersion therapy by dating a lot of women at once. But I hired some guy to host it and he thought it was a real dating show that he was hosting. Yeah. And so we invited him back to host this hour long special. But he really wanted week. to clear up the threesome story. Well, it yes, seemed like that was his had, biggest he agenda. He said he had a threesome in the first one, and he kind of. And we also felt like even going into this, we were like, "Well, that's not something we want to go into. That's like old news." And he just launched into it right <laughs> at the beginning, and so um, yeah, I guess you'll see how that plays out. So, what did, what did you think was the tipping point for when this show? When, when the right people were going crazy about it, was it dumb Starbucks or did it happen sooner? Well, I don't. It's kind of been a gradual, like a steady kind of increase. Yeah. Like different people kind of seem to. I mean, I don't know if yeah, different pe like you kind of came on to it early, and then throughout season one, I think more and more people got into it, and then dumb Starbucks was a thing where I guess we got lots of exposure yeah that was the biggest press kind of barrage yeah because it was it kind of went outside of the comedy world i guess as well and so we got a lot of attention from that and then but you know then last season there was a lot you know we got a lot i think it just has increased in a nice way i mean our goal with the show is always to like do things where even if you've seen every episode, you'll still be surprised right. at every turn. So that, you know, that's, I, I guess our, like, we don't, I feel like we haven't lost viewers. We just like keep growing, which is our goal. We don't want well, people to get I, bored of the show. There's not that many episodes, which helps. Right. It's, it feels like a treat when it returns. That's a marketing tactic. You know, I you like keep it. something rare and exclusive. <laughs> Like you put out how many? You put out an episode every week, right? Or I do, this? I do three and three probably, a week. Probably, right. I think people take me for granted. So yeah, so because of that, you know, no one sees it as that, that special. It's just you, like oh, Bill, you know, it's just <laughs> oh, Bill here's talking. another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we have a different approach. <laughs> Did you think about the binge watch era and how that might change your show and whether you should just release eight at once to just oh, that's flood not my people? call. Yeah, would um, you want to do that or no? In a different I, you know, world? I, I, I like... Yeah, I don't... It's hard to know what is... I mean, it's also... I do think with Nathan, for you, like, that the show is really dense. Yeah. Like, there's a lot that happens in every episode. So I do wonder if you're watching a bunch back to back if it would be kind of overwhelming see that's my argument like maybe i would it's say nice no. to have a week in between but i you, think with, it with is binging you can like on netflix you can choose right you can pick if you watch one or not 
the best binge watch shows on like Netflix. You just watched half an episode, and you only you only had. I'm one gonna and... finish it. It's I, I saw half, and I'm right. gonna finish it. I've I've so seen every though, minute of every like, of every show. You couldn't binge one, so. But if you did like the Riverdale model for your show, where it was kind of people could half watch it. I feel What's binge- the Riverdale model? Well, Riverdale's like you, there's Riverdale, there's Bloodline. Some of these Netflix shows, they're the, uh, what was the Thirteen Reasons Why. These are all shows that were eight episodes stretched out over 13. Oh. So you could never, you could kind of half watch and stuff would happen, but you never were like on the edge of your seat. It wasn't like Breaking Bad where every decision for every scene was made carefully. Which Breaking is what you're Bad doing with would have been show. a great one, I feel like, for binge watching, right? Well, so yes and no, because I caught up late to it. Same 2013. With me. And I watched them all. But here's really the problem. Quick. They're too addictive, and you're watching. I remember I was in Miami for the finals for NBA because I was on the studio crew, and I was catching up, trying to catch up to when the show came back, and I was falling asleep watching them on my iPad. Well, that's and a then time having like crazy, thing for crazy yeah. dreams because you know it's like a show about this so crazy meth dealer, and then I was like disoriented the next morning. That's the argument against binge watching. That's one of the arguments. Yes, you'll watch it while you start sleeping, right. and it'll affect your dreams. Yeah, and I think yeah, I think that could bring down Netflix. Um, you know. <laughs> Because no one wants nightmares. Yeah, no, it's part of their another part of their motto is they just keep rolling the shows, so you can fall asleep and the next one will start, mm. and you can be four in the morning and it's four episodes later and it's it's just this cacophony in the background. Anyway, I like I like the once a week. Yeah, it's a I, dense show. It's good. It comes. I'm looking forward to it. I think it's an old school model that works for this one. Yeah, I think the 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 ones that are together are like better when it's one story that continues right all right so since yeah. the last time we talked you don't want to talk about binge watching anymore no i want <laughs> i have an agenda <laughs> oh, okay. um the, since the last time we talked um you learned it, we haven't talked since you did the walk across the wire episode right which you yes. trained for nine months yes which i didn't realize yes i figured it was something because you have Kind of weird passions. I right. figured it was something I have you'd... like fancy hobbies. Yeah, like and you're magic like a fa- and... magician, and you have all these other little things you're good at. I figured <laughs> like at some point you were walking a wire in like the eighth grade and learned how to do it. But no. Well, I mean, no, I'm not yeah. very f- like. Look at my body. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm. I you, we are when we were coming up with that episode. That was actually an idea we had in um, the second season of the show, and we didn't really have the resources or time to execute it properly, so we like put it on hold. And when we started to do the third season, we were like, okay, we knew we wanted to do that. Yeah. So we had kind of thought about it, and I started training like very early. But in the initial discussions, I remember we had we talked for a while about there's got to be a way to do this where I don't have to be the one wire walking because it's such a waste of time for such a small, like it's one part of one episode and yeah. to learn this is like everyone we talked to, it's, they were saying like, it, it, it takes like two or three years to kind of really do it at that scale where you can do that. And so I, I, we couldn't figure out a funnier way or another way to do it. So I, I just started working at it and I started like doing it while we were shooting and writing. I would like train on the weekends. Isn't that what makes the show great though, is that you went all in on this one event that was a small part of one episode and you spent nine months training. To yes, do I, it. Yeah. And I that's do. kind of the secret that. sauce there. Yeah. And it was also in a weird way, because I'm in my head a lot. I feel like, you know, I'm distracted. And yeah. when you're wire walking, you can't think of anything else. Like if right. your mind starts to wander, you'll fall. So it was actually really good. It was kind of, I started to enjoy it as like a therapeutic thing just to be in the moment. It's like meditation. And yeah. It was almost like meditation in a weird way. And so, and it, and it became this kind of thing where it's just like, it's so frustrating at first because it seems so simple. Like you just want to get across a small wire. That's a couple feet off the ground at first. And it, it's, I couldn't do it. Like I couldn't. And it just becomes this thing where it's like a very clear challenge and you just want to get better at it. And you see yourself 
kind of getting better. So it feels like very satisfying because it's like a clear goal. So what, what other, what can come out of this now? You have this, this skill, this unique skill that no, I've never met anyone who could do this. Nothing. I can't do anything with it. Well, I think you could walk between high buildings. That could be the next thing. Well, I have Maybe to, you're like the man on a wire guy. Maybe. You mean try to do it at like. Yeah. I mean, maybe you just become it? the greatest. Who I do you have to have beat? There's like nine people you'd have to beat. You're right. I guess there aren't that many <laughs> You're halfway people, there. Right? You did most of the work already. Who's the guy that does it? Walenda. I, he probably Walenda. died. One no, of them died. No, his grandpa died. Yeah. They always show that at the beginning of his specials. His grandpa's... They show his grandpa dying. Yeah, it's on YouTube. I might have watched it. At the it. beginning, but like when he's doing... Because he did like the Grand Canyon or something. Yeah. And they show his grandpa falling to his death at the beginning to kind of establish the stakes. You and Is that I, weird? I I think it it kind of sets the tension, the proper amount of tension. It was like, this guy's family member died and now he's going to try to do it. Like, is it like, should you show then like someone getting like a hit in football and like getting carried off in a stretcher at the beginning of the game or like, like to kind of be like oh you could die event. yeah but, watch yes. this car crash before right we're like, yeah you you're right die. i guess that is weird but um last time you were on we talked about magic which i want to get everything to. to him and whatever he's doing <laughs> uh we talked about magic but yeah this whole like walking a wire and stuff I've always thought that the daredevil, the big stunts, the guy, I grew up with Evil Knievel on Wide World of Sports and Evil Knievel is going to jump over 32 trucks and he's going to try to jump across Snake Canyon and the stuff always works. And they did a, ESPN did a Vegas New Year's jump a couple times where the free fall bike jump and they always seem to work. And I wonder why do you think they have, there's not more of them? Aren't there what more? do you mean they, they seem to work, meaning no one dies or like a I lot think of people, people watch, watch them. It seems like they be, it becomes relevant for an I hour. Love, yeah, I love those big spectacle events. We need I've another Evil Knievel, them. I guess is my point. Yeah, because they have the tightrope guy and there was, well, Michael Phelps just did that thing that was. Uh, he, he raced a shark. I watched the whole total, thing. It was terrible. I watched it though. So they kind of promoted it like he was going to race a shark. Yeah, he did. It was called like Phelps versus yeah. shark, right? Or something. That's that's what it was called. And then the entire special, they kind of, they're very careful with their wording as to kind of like what's going to happen. They're kind yeah. of like, he will race a shark's speed or something like that. Like they use weird wording. And then at the end, he just raced a cartoon of a, it was like an animated Disney shark. There was not and, a lot of fear from the viewer watching it. Right. And they like made it like jump and do tricks. Yeah. <laughs> like it was really weird. Yeah. And it, I think it got a good rating somehow, which brings well, me back because to they my made point. It seem this like stuff he was going to race a shark. Yeah. It's kind of like they've done a lot of those, like the the guy with, um, did you see the Eaten Alive? The guy that said he was going to get eaten by an anaconda? No. How did oh, I miss it? That I don't know. That was like. I mean, I had like a group get together to watch that one. <laughs> Did the anaconda yeah. swallow him? So the idea was he said like he's going to get swallowed by an anaconda and then oh. like be in its belly. <laughs> that was the special. <laughs> and it was like the best premise for um, any special I've seen. I think it was actually happening while we were working on that wire walking episode. And uh Basically, the the snake he got put in all this like hockey gear, like so, like a helmet, That's smart. you yeah. know, all that, so he's safe. And then the second the snake like started to bite his helmet, he was like, "Oh no, it hurts!" And then he stopped. Was it live? No. Oh, so that was it. He just stopped, and the I don't show's think over. It was, no, it wasn't. This live. This sounds terrible. Yeah, and they had all this build up where they found a snake in the you know they always have to fill this stuff with like facts and information because yeah. we all want to know more about anacondas yeah but it definitely didn't pay off let's take a break to talk about an obsessively engineered mattress at a shockingly fair price let's talk about supportive memory foams creating an award-winning sleep surface with just the right sink and just the right bounce let's talk about casper mattresses try casper for 100 nights risk-free in your own home. If you don't love it, they'll pick it up. They'll refund you everything. Casper understands the importance of truly sleeping on a mattress before you commit. 
especially considering you're going to spend like a third of your life on it. They offer free shipping, returns to US and Canada with over 20,000 reviews and an average of 4.8 stars. It's quickly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. They mailed me a mattress two years ago and we've been using it ever since. I started sleeping better. It actually made me feel stupid that I didn't care about my mattress sooner. Now you can get $50 toward any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash BS and using offer code BS terms and conditions apply. Once again, that's casper.com slash BS code BS back to Nathan Fielder. Since the last time you were on David Blaine had his special with, with the celebrities. Right. He did another magic one. Where he freaked out basically all of these famous people. Yeah. And it was fantastic. It was one of the best shows I've seen on network TV in like five years. Yeah. I I really liked his last special because he had some, those, he kind of started to do really, the stunts got really big to the point where they, you know, because he did one where he was like hanging upside down for a few days, but yeah, he took a break every hour. So yeah. you're kind of like, what, what is this? Yeah. But he kind of took it back to kind of this type of magic where it's just a long shot where the camera holds on a wide shot. There's no like cuts. And I thought it was great. I thought it was really, and he did stuff that's kind of a mix of magic and stuff that he's just crazy enough to really do. The reactions from the celebs were fantastic too. Like it brought out this genuine Will Smith, Jada Pinkett reaction slash relationship where I felt like, oh, this is cool. This is who they actually are. Not like the people who go on talk shows. So after that show happened, I was like, Nathan, Nathan was in, he said it on the podcast. (laughs) Well, you did too. But you predicted on the podcast. I would love to see Will Smith react to to Nathan (laughs) Just a blank face i wonder if it's on his Speaking radar of will smith i actually learned about like steampunk in the past year What's i didn't that? know do you know what steampunk is no so have you seen that will smith movie like wild wild west uh unfortunately once and never again so that's steampunk apparently where it's like old-fashioned but futuristic at the same time yep and there's a whole world of steampunk Um, people that kind of create their own things and it's like it's metal it's like you know those goggles like those old fashioned like goggles yeah and then but it's also futurist I don't know how to explain it but each steampunk I guess has like you're supposed to develop your steampunk personality and it's called your steam sona what is going on I never heard any of this wait do you I feel like you're making this up. No, no. Will you Google um, steampunk and just show Bill like some of the images yeah, take that Google come up? Steampunk. Is this you'll, like- you'll recognize the aesthetic, but it, that's what like wild, wild. But there's a whole world and culture about. Like this guy. We turn it a little more. Yeah. Wait, I can't see. <laughs> you, do you, so do you, have you seen people dress like that sometimes or? Uh, no. It's probably the furthest thing from the sports world. Yeah, I mean, I'm not in that. That even that Comic Con is a little too far out there for me. And there's a steampunk band called Steam Powered Giraffes, and they do like a Rihanna cover. <laughs> Will you pull that up? <laughs> I just want to start showing YouTube videos to Bill. So, I, like, but there, this is a whole like world that I didn't even know about, and then I started uh, all everyone I worked with knew about steampunks, and I started asking. I actually ordered a pair of steampunk goggles while we were making the show just for fun because I just wanted to like wear them and see what it felt like. Was these um, like the goggles Buffalo Bill had in Silence of the Lambs, James Gum? The I, night, are they night vision or are they different? Uh, they're not no they're not night vision but maybe the people that wear them pretend they are or something right because it's futuristic i just want to get the definition of steampunk because i feel like i'm oh you do that's the steampunk music so it's a guy kind of like acting like a robot oh my god so last time you predicted magic was going to have a renaissance now you're predicting the steampunk revolution no. no okay I'm not predicting it. I think it's been going on. Okay, steampunk is a uh, sub-genre of speculative fiction or science fiction that emphasizes... Well, what are all these words? So (laughs) so it's basically like 
old technology fetish type thing. Oh. It's also used to refer to a trend in fashion and music. So maybe I'm like, yeah. So at what point does this become a search it's, on it's Pornhub? It's from the Victorian era, but it's they can do like futuristic things. What time, When does this become a porn search? Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure it is now. Can you right? no, 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 Google that. I'm sure, right? I've Steve never Pug. Googled that. I yeah. haven't. Good, but, um, I'm glad. Yeah, it's on Pornhub. Great. What is it? What's Steam, the title? Steampunk porn videos. It's a head zone. And you want to pull one no, up? No, or? no. Are you not allowed or is this? I don't want Tate to get a virus. We're not at Grandland anymore. <laughs> That's true. What do you care? <laughs> they can't fire you. So magic. <laughs> so magic. Do we feel like magic had a renaissance or no? It had uh, the David Blaine special. Right. I did actually. Cause you I predicted remember, a renaissance. I was like predicting. Like, did you pull one up? <laughs> yeah, it, didn't, it didn't look good. Oh, okay. <laughs> I gotta it didn't look like it was. At least, show, at least pull up the GIF, the screen grab. I, this is too, this is kind of dirty, right? We don't want to go into this zone. I, I, I mean, I don't, if I'm listening, I don't know. They Google, can't. The Google listeners images. can't see. Google images. Oh, no. Oh, my God. It's all there. Uh, it's all there. I can't see it. I can't unsee it. I'll look it up after. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I guess so. Yeah, I don't know if there has been like uh, a full magic renaissance. We but need I more do, magicians. I do, I do, is what we need. More magicians. More fight. We need more David Blaine's. There are people be doing all on his stuff. shoulders. There are people doing stuff that are um, a little more unique. Uh, actually, I, I think the the show I talked about before this guy Derek Delgadio, who has a show in New York, is really cool. He does, and I I used to do magic, yeah. like so I know a lot of things. Like, yeah. so it's very rare that I'll see a magic show where I don't know anything that's going on. But um, this guy Derek, who has a show in New York, I went to see it, and I I don't know what is going on, and it's not even about like the magic too. It's a lot of. I think he doesn't like being known as a magician because magic has a, such a bad reputation. You know what I mean? It's so yeah. corny. So he's trying to do his own thing that's like undefinable or something. But uh, there's still a lot of like amazing stuff in the show that I don't know how it's done. Um, but I think there's things like popping up and there's... But it's tough because you're kind of like... Magic is kind of... It feels a little like steampunk in a way because it's like so cheesy you know yeah yeah well now there's but so there's many no cool steam well i actually i don't want to make a judgment i don't know much about steampunk so i'm it's hard for me to talk about the world i know it's a big thing in porn we've discovered <laughs> and we know it's there's also like there's hoverboard porn too i don't know if you know about that what so it's like two people will be on um this is something <laughs> well i wonder if you would give me like a nod like oh yeah i know <laughs> this is not i think we kind of went from steampunk to this when we were yeah. researching this stuff but it's like two people will be on a hover <laughs> you know those hoverboards yeah they'll like go opposite directions and then go together so it goes in like that <laughs> like back and forth <laughs> it's not sexually enjoyable but mm, it doesn't um, sound it yeah i don't uh, you know i i don't like really pornography is not you know it's definitely disgusting and we shouldn't look at that has pornography i can't remember has that been a theme of an episode yet or no for you um not totally right well there there was like uh i did a lie detector test in one of the seasons where the guy asked if i like look at pornography but yeah. he was using uh a Toshiba laptop, so it, the, and old software, so it wasn't accurate. Right. Yeah, the results. What's going on this season? Um, what are some of the? Is well, there anything you can this, give away? Well, or no? this season. Well, yeah, we. The one thing, like we have this special one hour special before, but then, um, so we made this. We kind of set out to make this. Some things happen behind the scenes sometimes in the show that we're like. Oh, this might make an interesting episode. Like last season, we had the Summit Ice thing, which was a jacket company I started yep. because my old jacket that I wore supported the Holocaust <laughs> right. or like was pro Nazi, I think. Yeah. I don't know. And then so I created a jacket company that was like to promote Holocaust awareness and we give all the money to charity. 
And that was something that really happened, like, because I, I was wearing the jacket in the show. And so these things happen that were sometimes like, oh, this could maybe be a thing, and it intersects with the real world in an interesting way. And so this year, there was something that happened kind of like behind the scenes that we're like, oh, maybe this could be an episode or a segment. And then it turned into like a two hour story. Yeah. And so that's like our finale this year is two hours what? long. Yeah. Which is very, because we've even had a hard time like making stories that will last one episode because yeah. we'll sometimes do multiple. And so this one just took us into like a crazy territory that was very different than anything we've done on the show before. And I'm very curious to see what people think about it because it's like tonally very different than what we've done. So you went to Comedy Central and you said, I'm going to need two hours for no, the season finale? No, we didn't want to do that. We okay. just started shooting. And then like kind of near the end of shooting it, I called Kent Alterman, who's the... Yeah. Uh, president of comedy central oh, yeah. and i was like hey so like i know you like i have a contract to deliver like half hour episodes and i'm like this one's like gonna be a lot longer and he's like well how long and i'm like i think it might be like two hours long <laughs> and he's like he was really skeptical and he was like uh okay well why don't you edit it together and then like show it to me so we did and we screened it for him and he was like, okay, I see what you mean. And he's like, they made a two hour block for us to show it. They're the best to work with. Like Kent and Rachel Olson's our executive, but they're really great. Like in terms of letting us do what we want with this show. Yeah. I haven't, I don't think I've ever had such a great creative experience. Really good. It's not typical. Yeah, I, I don't know. They're just really cool. And I don't know if you know, but Kent, you know, do you know Kent? Or? Kent's a, I know Kent very well, and he's okay. a gigantic San Antonio Spurs fan. So if you ever need to really butter him up in some way. Why San Antonio Spurs? Is I, he from there? I, I, I can't remember how it, it ended up happening, but like he's a huge, huge, huge San Antonio Spurs fan. Huh. Good way to butter him up. Bring it up. Be like, hey, man, how about the Spurs? Looking good. But then Kawhi's then, looking great. And then just, what do I, what's fake my follow-up? No, you have question. like five statements. You just fake your way along. Okay, so the first one will be like, oh, how about those Spurs? Spurs looks looking good again. And, and they'll say, yeah, thing. you've been watching. You'll say, yeah, I think Kawhi has a chance to maybe win the MVP this year. Yeah, I think Kawhi is going to win the MVP. Then he'll be like, oh, yeah, he's been great. And then he'll throw something at you like, what do you think of the new guy? Oh, love him. And like, he's just like, he's been good. Been, been surprised. I've Pleasant just, surprise. I've never seen someone dribble like that. <laughs> it's like, and like, and then here's I love closer. that he's also like, he scores like a lot of points, but he also passes too, which right. is like Very so selfish. generous. Yeah. Right. And then you don't see a lot of players like that. Then your last one, your closer is, yeah. my only concern is I just don't know how, how much longer Popovich wants to do this. Right, right. That's yeah, the my coach because he's older. And I'm just going to, like, we don't have to talk about the Spurs all night, but I'll say as a final statement, like, I just don't know how long Popovich is going to want to do this uh, because of his health and everything. So That brings it down. That brings it, the energy down. Right. Kurt, right. Uh, <laughs> can't get sad. Right. And then you move on. Right. Then, yeah. he, then he goes, well, so how's the show going? That's good. Then right, I right, seem right. like you care. Popovich. It's the right his, move. So Popovich and Kawhi. Popovich and Kawhi. Popovich I remember is the Kawhi because Kawhi is like an island. Kawhi. Right, Hawaii. Yeah. He's one of the best five and guys. And it's spelled the same? Kawhi, yeah. Kawhi. Yeah. Not spelled, the same. Not spelled oh. the same, but pronounced the same. Kawhi, okay. Kawhi. And what does he like look like? He's 6'7". Okay. Um, does he still have the, the cornrows? Yeah, corn he's the last guy in the league with cornrows. Okay. And he's like a great two-way offense defense guy. Okay. And Popovich is... He's the, 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 the old grumpy coach who... Mm -hmm. When they interview him during the games, he yells at the sideline reporters and or gives them one word answers. He's like every he's like America's favorite curmudgeon sports coach. Right. So Popovich, I'll remember. I'll come up with like a rhyme to remember. Like Popovich. Popovich. He's. Uh, but you call him Pop. He's an old witch. Oh, this is. <laughs> yeah. Kawhi Leonard. Okay. There you go. And Leonard you've, is a. You've never done a sports name. theme episode, though, have you? Like a, with like a professional sports? No. no. Well, Nothing. actually, this season, yeah, um, we do something where we have a. Uh, and this is Popovich. 
Yeah. And he, his mouth is just open in this photo. It's not always like that, right? No, it's usually like that. Oh, it's okay. wide open. He's yelling at people. Cool. Yeah. So this, well, this seems like sports are really fun. It really, there's a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we actually do something this year where uh, we, there's like a chili shop that uh, was trying to get their chili sold in like as a vendor yeah. in a hockey arena for the hockey team. Um, it's like below, what's the one below NHL, AHL? AHL. Yeah. And um, they wouldn't allow, even though it was like known as like a good chili in town, they wouldn't allow it in. So we designed like a uh, chili suit that goes under your clothing that holds 40 pounds of chili with a peristaltic pumping system so we could secretly serve it. And we come up with this elaborate way to sneak it into the stadium so he can sell it kind of like bootleg. So that's kind of sports. Kind of. Yeah. Cause it's, you know, at ho hockey game, you want chili. When did you finish all these? To finish shooting the, all these episodes. Yeah. How long they've been. We just sound mixed the finale like, um, last week. So we're still kind of, yeah. And then when do you start planning the next season? Well, uh, uh, you know, at this point, are we I'm breaking news right now? <laughs> <laughs> at this point, I'm always like, well, it's kind of like what you said. Like, you're like, how can you do more of these? And that's how I feel every year. I'm like, well, how can we possibly do more? I'm always like exhausted after each season. But I always want to feel like there is a good reason right. to do it. Like, Rather than just like trying to deliver and like make up things, like it's starting at a place of like, oh, there's like a good thing that we want to explore that works within the format of the show. Well, you must get offers to do movies and stuff, right? Um, probably less than you'd think. Really? <laughs> Nobody wants you to like write a script or no people yeah. write a crazy yeah people... version of your version of a rom com or all that yeah, kind of I weird love stuff. romance, so I'm like always promoting that and like <laughs> eager to i yeah i feel like i could be like do you feel like i could be in like a rom-com or like a modern sleepless in seattle type situation yeah I, I have like that was billy crystal right that was tom hanks oh what was the billy crystal well, can you be a that was i uh, when harry met Sally. yeah yeah so i'm like can you be a magician who can't find love and then when you do the press tour you're you're just insisting that this is not based on david blaine at all is that what no, he, does he have just, a problem with finding? No, love? he's he's a legendary ladies man, right? This would I be maybe that. this magician I is not that. a ladies man. Oh, so <laughs> maybe he's so it isn't based no, on David. No, that's Blake. why you'd be insisting it wasn't him. I yeah, know. I think there could be like you know just like kind of romance. Um, <laughs> you did that. And, uh, so what what other what other movie ideas there? Detective. I'm trying to think of all the generic movie tropes. Well, you know, I. Yeah, detective could be good. Um, like you have I, a partner, you know, I, like a robot dog. One thing I do feel like that I've kind of wanted to do is like, do you know the show Columbo? Yeah. Oh yeah. So I, I love, love those '70s detective shows. Yes. Yes. Peter I used Falk. to. Jim Rockford was my guy though. I like Rockford Files more than Columbo. Really? Yeah, I did. And Vegas was my favorite favorite of the '70s ones. I think Columbo. Yeah, I guess. I, I never got into the Rockford Files as much. I did people, you you were in one camp or the other. I was always but Jim But isn't Rockford. Columbo kind of unanimously seen as the better one? I think so. I right, think it was right. not unanimously, but I think more people probably like it. I think it's it. unanimous. I'll, I'll look it up <laughs> after. <laughs> um, Do you remember Vegas, though? Um, Dantana, Robert Yurick? No, no. He's in is, Vegas. I'm a millennial, so I might be. They, well, they, different they show the replays a lot. Oh. You're not a millennial. Yes, I Are am. Are you officially a millennial? I was born in 83. The cutoff is 83. Is that true, Tate? Uh, yeah, give it to him. What? Wait, what are you? I don't, I don't identify. What? <laughs> no, Tate's a millennial. What year, what, what year were you born? Uh, yeah. Oh, oh my God. So we're, yeah, we're the same. <laughs> uh, I'm proud to be a millennial. Cutoff's 83, just in the cutoff. You're definitely not a millennial. Excuse me? You're not a millennial. Why am I not a millennial? Look How it up. How are you a millennial? Look it up. Who said the cutoff was 83? Every article written about millennials. <laughs> Look it up. I am 100% a millennial. I always thought you That's had to be... That's why on some things we don't relate. You had to be out of high school in the 21st century to be a millennial, right? 
Or to, to not be a millennial. Is he right? <laughs> we just see the world a little differently than you. Millennials are those born between 1983 and 2000. That's, that's a ridiculous definition. I don't agree with that. You're the first millennial. I'm one of the first, yes. Maybe that's your rom-com. You're the first millennial. Right. The or, first or millennial. Or the last millennial, it could be called. The last millennial. Yeah. Well, now it's Gen Z is the new generation. Gen Z? That's what they're they, calling what it. I don't know if for? it's going to take. Gen Z is basically, they're on Instagram and Snapchat, and they're trapped to their phones, and they have no attention span. But that they, they also have a great attention span because they can do seven things at once. And millennials is more like, we like rock and roll music and... <laughs> <laughs> right like we love we outside. right <laughs> right oh that's you're sensitive we grew up playing outside yeah you're sensitive you've had the internet for most of your life we have more because there's also that um what is it called the indigo kids or something is that one like the kids that are supposed to have like a sixth sense isn't that a thing indigo kids no it's not indigo it's something like that Will you Google that? Indigo, indigo, <laughs> indigo children. Indigo children. And what does it say? It's like they're, they have a, a special connection with Mother Earth. Yeah, New Age concept. Uh, possess special, unusual, sometimes supernatural traits or abilities. Ooh. Yeah. That sounds like Stephen King area. And that's like starting, that's like 15 years younger than us. I have this. <laughs> they're not real. <laughs> <laughs> I have 17 signs that you're an indigo, an indigo child. That's what you have up there? Yeah. I, I, yeah, I'm not an indigo, but I'm, I'm uh, tight. So what generation are you? I'm, the I'm greatest? firmly Gen X. Gen X. That was like, I was right out of college when, uh, I might have even been graduating college when that guy released it. And Gen X was like pre-internet, kind of post-baby... The kids of baby boomers, basically mm -hmm. the early baby boomers, and no, we all you came out like of college. The system. Yeah, no, it was more like we came out of college, and and uh, it was harder to find a job because it was pre-internet. But we had like the sad music and the sad kind of grunge music. But then there was also the birth of rap and hip hop, and um, pop culture was super important back then. Sports. Yeah, for for millennials, one of our defining traits is that we don't understand <laughs> the concept of selling out. Right. Do you know that? There's this, um, I'm kind of obsessed with this frontline documentary that they did called Generation Like, and it's about millennials and their value system. I mean, it's kind of featuring uh, kids like in high school now. Yeah. But I still see them as a peer because we're the same generation. But um, <laughs> they, the most fascinating part of it is they ask all the kids like, what does it mean to sell out yeah and th th they're like it's not like you have a bunch of stuff and you sell it all and the actual concept of selling out doesn't make any sense to millennials because their goal is to be sponsored right that's like what they want so the kardashian they generation. kind of know it has a bad connotation but they it it like glitches their brain in a way like it like or our brain <laughs> Well, because <laughs> I need to drop <laughs> your <this. brain. laughs> it's, it's hard. I can't talk about this without um, well, your yeah. generation. I think we, we it's don't. more about, you know, YouTube views, Instagram follower numbers. That's yeah, what you YouTube guys stars. care about. And yeah, they, they have all these like kids sitting around talking about like why a photo got more likes and what they need yeah. to do and like to get more likes. It's actually kind of uh, horrifying the the frontline thing. They play it very straight. But it kind of like, it's showing these like famous YouTube Instagram people, but then also showing like young kids who are doing it. Yeah. And then the kid's mom. That's like an a, industry. It's like a seven-year-old girl and the kid's mom is like, well, she gets more likes when she wears a bikini or something. So. Oh, no. Yeah. Anyways. My kids. Highly recommend. <laughs> my kids love Logan Paul. Right. Logan Paul is a big, big, big thing with basically third fourth fifth sixth seventh grade i don't know if you've seen his work okay so i'm like recently learned about the logan paul, paul the paul brothers yes logan and jake Jake's i read that the more business, controversial one i read that business insider profile on logan yeah yeah which is an incredible article 
I've actually had a conversation with a parent friend of mine about whether Logan Paul is going to be remembered like the Beastie Boy, like my generation remembered the Beastie Boys. How do they? As so, these, what, how do they relate to them? Or like, what is the? Well, like my kids think Logan Paul, like he's doing really how old are your important. Kids? I have a nine and a half year old son and a twelve year old daughter. Right, right. My nine and a half year old son thinks Logan Paul is doing like great and important work, like when he does these songs that he creates he knows all the words the mm -hmm. same way if you were 12 you knew the beastie boys in 1988 mm -hmm. well Which logan is, paul did that or his brother jake jake's the one who's controversial because he did that there was that ktla news story where he was like dennis the menace right he like was in his neighborhood yeah he was like, antagonizing the neighborhood right then he had of. a feud with rice gum who's another youtube person <laughs> oh my god and everybody picks sides but a lot of people feel like rice gum won because jake paul backed off right when was rice gum rice gum's another youtube name? guy yeah well that's his youtube identity he oh. does videos oh so it's ba it's basically like the East Coast West Coast rap wars, but is that with, how kids but kind with of view smaller it? internet people and with way less stakes. Nobody gets shot and killed. Well, the best part about the Jake Paul thing because he released that um, he had that video, the KTLA news thing, and then he released a uh, kind of an apology rap, right. or where he was kind of saying like, "You don't really know me." Apology raps usually don't work. It's incredible. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's the fail rate of apology um, raps are a hundred percent. Because he's kind of saying like, you saw that clip of me terrorizing the neighborhood, but like, you guys didn't report on all the good stuff I do. Yeah, I think he says like, where was y'all at when I was like, help helping feed kids on Thanksgiving? <laughs> Poor yeah, kids. They, yeah. yeah, Jake Paul. There's another side apparently. And. uh yeah, I think those two videos, like the KTLA and then that rap, are the the current best one-two punch on the internet uh, right now, in my opinion. I'm obsessed with this Instagram feed called Drunk People Doing Things. Oh. And it's just drunk people doing things. And it's like uh, drunk people deciding it would be a good idea to try to jump across a pool and not making it. And funnels gone wrong and oh really i, I, I gotta I, check that I, out i'm obsessed with it and they try to spin it had a lot of success it's got almost two million followers so then they decided like high people doing things and animals doing things but drunk people doing things is the franchise like i they can spread it out all they want someone showed me this one a while ago i don't know if it's still around but it was called hot guys reading hot guys reading have you <laughs> no. it's all like uh taken on like new york subways yeah or something and it's just uh, attractive men reading books like but not their phones like reading physical wow. novels is that still there something like that but then they write kind of like a uh objectifying description of the guy kind of uh playing out their fantasy last uh, summer i became kind of obsessed funny. with this there's this guy named eight booth i mean i'm not attracted to the guy so I'm just <laughs> i think it's kind of funny we're not judging uh there's this guy named Eight Booth who was doing these high risk jumps. Mm. And he was like jumping from the eighth floor of hotels. He was doing jumps that were illegal. He's wearing a mask. Mm. And he's like, all right, he's jumping from the eight, eighth floor balcony of a hotel into the pool mm. and then running out and getting, getting out of there before he gets arrested. And he kept escalating the stakes and he probably did like 15, 16 jumps. And I became obsessed with the guy. And I watched all the jumps. My kid and I, we were watching him. The guy does this hotel jump. He miss miss times or misjudges it, and his nails his feet on the side of the pool and like shatters both of his feet. Crawls out, gets arrested. There's been these stories about him, and it's like that's it. His career's over. So there's a dark side to this stuff too. Well, I'm actually I've thought about it. Like YouTube started in 2005, right? And at that time I was uh, 22, and I'm so thankful that YouTube was not around when I was 13. Cause I know I would have done some very dumb stuff for the sake of like, cause I was like more reckless, I think when I was younger. Oh yeah. And so it's weird now. Cause like kids are doing <clears throat> those crazy things to try to get views and it's the kind of there forever. Yeah. Even if you delete it, it do probably still lives kids? somewhere. Like, do you have to say to your kids? Like, what do you say about that? Like posting stuff or. So my kids, their accounts are private. 
which, and my daughter really wants her account to be public so she can get more followers. And I've had to explain to her why this is a bad idea. Mm. But, um, it was interesting. My son, we put, we put this one video of him doing, he did like this impersonation of a wrestler Mm -hmm. and we put it out there and just kind of forgot about it. And a year later, He's like, is that video still up? And we looked and it had, it was like half likes and half dislikes. And people were like, this kid sucks and all this. And he read the comments and he was like devastated. Oh, really? <laughs> and it, but, and I was like, this is funny. This is what the internet does. But he was like, he really thought it was. And that's when I was thinking like, wow, this is why it's a bad idea for kids to put stuff up on the internet. Like you just take shit from these random people. And if you're nine years old, it's hard to deal with. Yeah, and you also like then start developing yourself based on like what the internet likes, right? The likes and the dislikes, right? And that's kind of scary idea. Well, that's one of the problems with writing right now is that people people are afraid to write anything that they might get slaughtered on the internet about. So they kind of they kind of drift toward these safe places, right? Right. And so you got this basically everybody trying to write the best versions of the same topics. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. And, uh, and there's no kind of going against the grain, which, so it's a little more boring. You just have to get more inventive, but it's so easy now on Twitter. If somebody writes or does something and people just like, look, to grab like the one sentence or the one paragraph. And then all of a sudden you're getting That's slaughtered for two days. Yeah. You haven't had to have that. You haven't dealt with that with your show though. With I don't what? think you haven't had an episode that was like the controversial where I can't believe he mad. did this episode. Yeah. And you had the outrage culture came after you. No, but you know, I'm always ready for that to happen. It's kind of your dream. You would love <laughs> no, it. No, it's not. I don't <laughs> want to deal with that. Oh my gosh. I don't know. We always like, we put a lot of thought though into like what we're doing and kind of our approach. It's not super like, well, at least, you know, when we, sh- we shoot, we try a lot of things, but then in the edit, we're think- we think about like how we approach certain subjects and make sure we're not like, yeah. Who's I mean, there, we do some stuff too about like, I don't want to, because I think in general, like I am kind of like worried about, I don't want to offend, you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not like someone who's like, here's my opinion, like eat it. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> Is that what people say? Eat it. Because I, I feel like in general, I'm fairly like, I'm kind of uncertain about things. And I'm like, oh, like some will say their perspective and I'll be like, oh, that's I, that's right. And then someone else will say theirs and I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's a good point. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm like very open to things. And I think because of that, I do feel like there's always a pressure to like have a strong opinion about something. Yeah. And I don't have that about a lot of things. And I think that's like a weird, cause I think that's the internet too, is like people having really strong opinions about like, this is what you got to think, or this is how to feel. And sometimes I don't, but I need, I feel like a pressure to pretend I do, you know, maybe that could be like part social of your gimmick. pressure. Yeah. Maybe your gimmick could be just not that the opinions aren't that strong. That what You're do just, you mean? I don't know. They're just, just opinions. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like, like cheeseburgers like have to be cooked. State, I feel like the natural human state is like total uncertainty and yeah. like not being sure about like anything really. And then you're kind of like you develop opinions. I, I, there are obviously certain things you feel like strong, like, you know, like, oh, murder is bad. <laughs> like, you know Cancer what I mean? Stinks. Like I have an opinion. Yeah. But then there's, you know, I think like. It's like every little thing that comes out, people, like the articles you were saying, people have to have like a strong view that goes into the safe zone. But they're like, this is what how things should be. I yeah. read the Rolling Stone profile of you and there was one part where you were like, that's not going to be the angle, is it? Like you got mad at the writer. I, I wasn't mad. Honestly, I-, I think the like a lot of those situations were like a little like misread in terms of like what my experience was. Yeah. The writer was incredibly, he was a really nice guy, but he was like very, very nervous Yeah, the whole time. And he was like kind of shaking when he was asking me some questions. So I kept kind of being like, are you okay? Like, why do you want to, like he was asking about my divorce and he yeah. was asking about like, um, certain things with like, the show but he looked very uncomfortable so i was like wondering why he was going down this road if he seemed very uncomfortable with it and he kind of said at one point he was like i was like why did you uh because he was like oh tell me about your divorce or whatever and i was like 
Oh, well, I don't like talking about like personal stuff, like with like press or whatever. And yeah. I was like, you look so uncomfortable asking though. Why? And he was like, well, cause I knew you, why'd you ask? And he was like, well, I knew you wouldn't want to answer. And I was like, well, that's not the best reason to ask a question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess I do that a lot in the show. So I understand, uh, you're trying to get something interesting. Yeah. I've obviously been on both sides of this. Like I've written stuff like that. I've written features about people and I've also been written about. Yeah. And it does seem like when people do those pieces, they feel like if they don't bring up the one or two uncomfortable things, either they ask you or they write about it, then it would look like they're in the bag for you. It, uh, that's, oh, that's, right. And you know I, I, mean? I get that. Yeah. And I, I'm like, I'm like conflicted too. Cause I like, I want something to be interesting. Like I want people to read it and be like, Oh, this is, we're learning about something. I mean, think of all the stuff we've learned in the last 45 minutes. Yeah. I'm we've sure. Learned, we've, we went know, on like, Pornhub. We, 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 all, <laughs> all kinds of great things happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I want it to be like <laughs> people to know how much I'm into hot guys reading. Um, <laughs> definitely want that to be out there uh yeah the, so the reality like, is it's not fun to be written about well and you're never gonna like, be happy with it there's always gonna be one sentence you're like ah, oh, why is that in there well i want people to watch the show right you know what i mean and so but then you have to feel like oh you have to give some of yourself and stuff and that's cool but it's like i don't think i'm very interesting like i put a lot of effort into like making the show a good product so people will enjoy but I'm, I don't feel as myself, I'm like that interesting of a person to talk to. So I'm like a, probably a little insecure about just doing stuff where I'm like, yeah, this is me and this is my life. Quick break to talk about our old friend, me undies. We have been together now for almost two years. We're almost at the two year anniversary of the BS podcast. Me undies was a sponsor on the first podcast we did summer. Perfect time to upgrade your underwear drawer. And now it's the end of summer. Now, now we're heading to fall. Still a great time. MeUndies, the ultimate feel-good undies. Designed in LA, every pair of MeUndies made with micromodal, a fabric three times softer than cotton. Soft, stretchy undies that come in an ever-changing way of colors and patterns. No matter what your style, they've got something for you. They just mailed me a couple more underwear. Uh, I love their the saggy boxers, but... They had Fruit Loops on them. It was a Fruit Loop underwear, and my kids were super excited. Don't ask why my kids saw me in my underwear. Um, when you're a parent, it happens. But uh, Fruit Loop underwear, Tate, don't judge me. Why did Tate just judge me? Uh, MeUndies comes in all kinds of colors and patterns. New limited edition patterns each month that always sell out. I wonder if the Fruit Loops sold out. For the fellas, diamond seam pouch cradles your jewels. Give your stuff the gives your stuff the support it needs without feeling too tight. That's why I like the MeUndies. Right now, you'll save 20% off your first pair and receive free shipping only at MeUndies.com slash BS. And if you don't love the first pair, they are free. 20% off free shipping, 100% satisfaction guarantee on the best, softest underwear you, you will own. MeUndies.com slash BS. It is a limited time offer. What are you waiting for? Back to Nathan Fielder. I had no idea you knew Seth Rogen for that long. That was my biggest revelation from oh, that yeah. interview. I had, somehow we did two podcasts. I don't think that came up. We, but when I yeah, say long, we, I mean like you knew each other when you were babies. kids. Like yeah, you were kids. early millennials together. Yeah. Well, he's actually a year older, so I think he's 82. So he's oh, a different he doesn't generation get the than me. Yeah. That's weird. It's amazing you guys got along. Yeah. He's Generation <laughs> X and I have a millennial. So, you know, we, we, you there's always out. like a bit of a disconnect because yeah. like we had different interests. <laughs> Um, so did, was he somebody that you knew early on was going to go do something? Yeah, he was always so funny. Well, we did um, we did improv together in high school. There was like an improv team. And yeah. he, he was doing stand-up in high school, age 13. He started doing it and wow. kind of like sneaking on stage in these places that they wouldn't even allow anyone over 19. Drinking age is 19. Yeah. Canada, 19 to like get into. And... Uh, he was always just so, the most naturally funny. And then he actually, we did the improv team and like he, he left the school to go do, I think it was undeclared or freaks and geeks. One of the two. Yeah. Freaks and geeks. And, uh, it made sense. I mean, he is so, he's clearly yeah. good to do that for a living. Yes. Like I actually think at that time, like 
I was a little because I was trying to do comedy, but I wasn't quite like as developed as he was. Like the type of jokes he made back then, I feel like are very similar to like the stuff he does now. Right. Yeah. Was he was he the first person who introduced I mean, better, you to weed? Obviously. Did he introduce you to weed? I mean, weed had to no, be a factor with big, him back then. He was way more into weed than I was. Yeah. Yeah. I never got into it. I because okay, well the reason I think is because like I would every time I smoke, I would fall asleep right away. I so it doesn't in social environments, it doesn't Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. And I'm already kind of like sleepy in social <laughs> environments. Like I'm not the most talkative and stuff. So it's kind of like the opposite effect. Well, now they have these. But I also haven't tried drugs that do like the other thing. Like they give you pep and yeah. What's the like one? Cocaine. Is that what it does? <laughs> yeah. What was it like when you did? I've it? never <laughs> tried cocaine. <laughs> oh, you'd have. <laughs> I've actually somehow never even been know, in the though? room with cocaine. You've yeah. been in a room. I've never been in the room. You've never. I've like, never had even seen it. I've never seen somebody it. cut lines up in, like a bathroom stall. Yeah, or I've anything. had a very sheltered life. Um, what, what, what's the, what drugs have you done? Pot. Pot? That's yeah. it? Nothing more? Pot. What about shrooms? No. Really? No. Nah. I had a weird... I did that in high school. I had a weird thing Twice. though. When, when I was 16... Second time <laughs> though was bad. Was bad. Yeah. And that was so it. I stopped doing it. Yeah. When well, I was, not like I would have kept doing it, but... When I was 16, the Celtics drafted this guy, Len Bias, who was like the number two pick in the draft that year. And okay. he was this guy who was going to be like our best player. And he overdosed on cocaine two days later. And that like legitimately scared me from drugs after that. Really? It had like a profound effect on me. Yeah. How old were you? I was 16. Wow. I was even afraid to try pot for a while. That's then why I realized I, eventually like pot's fine. Yeah. That's why I'm into Kawhi because he's like a clean player. Like he right. doesn't do drugs at all. Yeah, we don't and know what so, Popovich has been up to. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I feel like he's really the best part of this conversation is Lewis K just freaking out that we're just openly talking about drugs. You just see his brain. Going. You know, one thing about pot now, though, if you're in California, but everyone does, it's legal here, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of like, get a card. It's not a big. The uh, they have stores in California for pot where you can buy pot that will give you the mood you want to get. So if you, there's like gregarious pot, you could buy pot, you could smoke it, you'd be gregarious. You'd actually, you wouldn't be asleep. You'd go the other way. Yeah. I had an, like I did at one point, I don't like maybe once a year I'll smoke a little bit or something, but like, uh, I don't really do it, but there was one time, I think a, a couple years ago where I was like really anxious Yeah, and, uh, one day I just went out to one of the fake the weird doctors you know who do the cards and i like got the license and then it's i so went easy to get the, to the store and i bought it and they, i think they were all making fun of me because i didn't know anything like the two different strains or whatever they yeah. were telling me about and i was kind of they're like how do you want to feel and i was like i don't know just like a little, real, little relaxed it was really weird but the doctor was like when i went to the doctor to do it he He's like, so what do you have? And I'm like, I'm just feeling a little anxious, but I don't like, and he was slid this like list towards me with like the conditions that are acceptable to get the license. Yeah. And then he like pointed to the list and he's like, so what are you feeling? And I was like, just a little anxiety. And then he like pointed to the list harder again. And I was like, uh, oh yeah, I guess I'm like, uh, I have a bit of pain too. <laughs> like, I, it's a, it's not a real thing, right? They just nah. kind of like have to do the it. The new racket with this is emotional support dogs, which you, you've seen on the airplane. What do you the, mean? You're allowed to take dogs on the airplane now if you have, uh, if you, if you're like uptight or you need like the emotional support of a dog. Yeah. Your doctor can say this, this, my, my patient needs to have a dog to make him feel calm and safe on an airplane. And now people are abusing this left and right. And it's just an excuse to take your dog to wherever you're going uh -huh. and, uh, and not have to pay for like a dog shelter or doggy care or whatever. Right. Well, so you there's go on a whole, planes like, now, there's dogs everywhere. And it's like, that's not an emotional support dog. That's just your dog. It's like the, the, the DSM is like, doesn't it grow every year? The, yes. 
mental condition thing and it's like everyone now has something and it's easy to get somebody to write you a note these days yeah, yeah i had one last thing to mention before we go okay i, I wanted to pitch you one bored? is that why you're ending no it? we're, oh, okay. we're up, cool. it's almost I'm, 12 o'clock yeah oh okay um i don't know how it goes the uh, like we went longer at grantland I, <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> Since I don't know a lot about sports, right, or I don't like, I used to follow the Canucks and the BC Lions a lot. <laughs> Do you know the BC Lions? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so when it, talking to me after I did this podcast, I talked to people about you, and they would say like, "Oh, he's really good because he kind of gives an opinion that other people don't, and oh. he's really honest with his like take, and you don't people find it really refreshing." Well, that's nice to hear. Yeah, I hope that's still the case. Lewis, I think gave, it's nice. Lewis gave me a thumbs up. I mean, I didn't mean it in terms of like, I like talk to you for an hour, then I'm like, why do people like this guy? <laughs> uh, but uh, no, I just it was it was yeah. It seems like you have a really loyal following. Oh, people really love you. It's nice to hear. Well, I would say the same about you, Nathan. Oh, for you. you, what time? When is it? When is the launch? So uh, this Thursday we have the hour long special called Nathan for You Celebration. Time? 10 p.m. And then the new but season starts after that. check your DVR because it's weird sometimes. So yeah. check your thing. And then a week later, the new season starts um, 10 p.m. September 28th. Great. Good luck. This was fun. Thanks, third Phil. book trilogy is in the books. Yes. It's our third one trilogy. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I, I know what that word means. <laughs> Taking one more quick break to talk about House of Carbs. That's Joe House's podcast. He's been on this podcast a bunch of times. House of Carbs is heating up to the point that... Famous chefs are emailing him asking to come on House of Carbs. That's the level of uh, food conversation we have on this. It's a podcast for the hungry, by the hungry. Check it out, House of Carbs. And while you're subscribing to Ringer's podcast, Ringer podcast, don't forget about Black on the Air with Larry Wilmore, which has just had a bevy of famous guests and some of the best conversations you're going to get on politics on celebrity, on race, on news, on sports, you name it. Larry Wilmore, it's fantastic. It's called Black in the Air. Check it out. One more person to plug here, and it's not a person. It's a website. From a gambling standpoint, we are going to remember the 2010s as the decade when live betting took off. Where you're betting is just as important as who you're betting on. Here's an idea. Go to mybookie.ag. They've been in the business for years. Their reputation rock solid. They do 100% cash bonuses. Off the bat, you're making money for doing nothing. They have the fastest payouts, just two business days. In-game live betting, the most rewarding player perks in the business and an all-new mobile site that makes wagering on the go. A breeze. In-game live betting, a new frontier. Check it out. Lay down some cash. Try to win big today. Join now and my bookie will match your deposit with a 100% bonus. All you have to do is visit mybookie.ag. Use the promo code Bill Simmons to activate the offer. You play, you win, you get paid. Coming up right now, The Ringers, Mike Lombardi. Our old friend, Mike Lombardi is here. It's nice to be the back. The Ringers own. He's got the GM Street podcast twice a week on The Ringer NFL show, which has been excellent and very useful this year. I wanted to talk about, uh, about um, how sloppy it's been in September. Yeah. This seems like a a trend that Kevin Clark wrote about it today about the kind of the unwatchability of the NFL right now. It seems like a September trend that has happened, I would say three to four straight years. I don't feel like this was the case like in 2012. His theory was that combination of not as much practice time plus how offenses have changed and it's just check down, check down, check down, make the safest pass game manage, keep it in the game, and only a few teams are willing to experiment. Is there anything else missing from the puzzle? I think two factors. I think the practice time is definitely, I think offensive line play, because they can't go inside the facility in February and March. Yeah. Offensive line play is like a golfer. You have to practice your swing every single day or else you lose it. So we've lost offensive lineman player development. So you think it's almost like the short game in golf? Exactly. You've got to work at it constantly. And 
if you you don't have enough time and so yeah. those young guys need to go in there in february and march so that factor i think the coaching level has really dropped yeah i think we have guys that just call offenses and defenses but they're not truly head coaches so the preparation of preparing your team is way different than getting your team ready for the season i think that factor and and i and i think there's too many too many times where in september Player, the players aren't really ready to play. So preseason, even though there's been so many days, teams really haven't utilized preseason effectively enough because they're too worried about getting their team to the first game as opposed to getting their team prepared for the first game. And I think you see it, and I, and I think the conditioning level's bad, pad level's bad. I think that's why the product's bad. They've got to change the CBA or else it's going to keep getting worse. Yeah, Tell I was going to ask you, what do you think the solution is? Because September has now turned into kind of a fancy preseason. Belichick's called pre September preseason for the last four years. He calls yeah. it a continuation of preseason. You know, I, I think they have to change the CBA. And I, look, I agree the CBA, the coaches started having mini camps and OTA days. It's too hard. But offensive and defensive linemen need to go in there in February and in March and in in April and really just work. I think they need to change that or else they won't develop any offensive linemen because the college game is so bad and terms of developing offensive linemen they're all in a two-point stance nobody run blocks so you have to almost detrain to then retrain players for pro football very very hard to do in a short span of time you so, you were talking about this on my podcast six years ago yeah no i i know it's been it's been a problem you were saying college was eventually going to ruin the pros and it has. And I think what you have to do in pro football is take what Seattle has tried to do to a degree, but they don't have enough time to do it, is take defensive linemen and turn them over to offensive linemen. But you can't do it. The Giants tried to do it with with the, with the kid this year in camp, and there's not enough time to do it. You need a yeah. full off season to do it. You need all that time. It can't happen. But you're seeing it. Look, the Saints are 1-11 and since 2014 in September. I mean, and Sean Payton's a good coach. Like, that's not just a bad time. That could be an are we sure Sean Payton's a good coach at They're this exactly point. right. I mean, because his team's not prepared. Because people can lose it. Jeff Fisher was a good coach in the early 2000s, and then all of a sudden he wasn't. But he was in Tennessee with McNair. But clearly he hasn't figured out a way to embrace the new procedures of the offseason, yeah. of how you have to handle Because his team's not ready to play. He's won one game. It was a home game against Minnesota in 14. I mean, it's hard to come back. What was the stats last night? They said it was a 10% chance of making the playoffs when you start 0-2. Yeah. I mean, I mean, he's always behind the hole. He's always – now he's got to go to Carolina this week and win it. That's a challenge. You did the Blue Chippers podcast with Tate. You did uh, offense, then you did defense, then you did the coaches. Your top five Blue Chipper coaches, Belichick, Carroll, Reed, Tomlin, McCarthy, seven and three. Right. And – Two of them have played each other already. Yeah. Usually that number is maybe even be eight and two or nine and one. The next group you had you had the red chippers, Harbaugh on the Ravens, uh, Zimmer, Sean Payton, Quinn, Rivera. I would not have put Sean Payton in there. I think you're you're more loyal to him because of the past history because he won a Super Bowl. I get it. I I just think that team's sloppy, and I think they've been sloppy for a couple of years now. I would put, I think Gase is a really good coach. I, to I, me, he's a top 10 guy now. I think Gase is a really good coach. I don't disagree with you on that. I think Gase is a better head coach. I, you know, now, I, look, he got some help with Anthony Lynn last week. Oh, my God. He, he's, Poor Anthony. Anthony should be 2-0. and Anthony should be 2-0. and and, and the problem with Anthony is he doesn't realize he should be 2-0. and No, he's like thinking the kicker. It was the yeah, kicker's like, fault. I, this, we talked about this on the podcast on Sunday. I hate this mentality. We're going to get in range to attempt the field goal. We have to get in range to make the field goal. So he has two a 44-yard kick. He lets the kid. The kid hasn't made a 44 in the well, first. He also, he called the timeout with 20 seconds left when they got the first down. Right. When Rivers should have run up, spiked Spike the it, ball. you have one more play, then you use the timeout. You got to get to like the 38. And that adds to more of this problem that we're having is this game management, situational football. You see it in college, the, the Tennessee-Florida game. Horrible situational football yeah. by Tennessee. You see it in pro football. I mean, Sean McVay gets away with one on Sunday uh, where he has the ball. And he's got like a minute 17, or no, about a minute, two minutes to go in the half. And he tries, he, it, what, what does he think? He have some explosive offense. 
He yeah. tries to get it going. They they get he can't complete the incomplete pass. Stops the uh, stops the clock. They run call timeout. Then he gets a sack strip fumble. Now the Redskins get the ball with a minute seventeen to go, right. and they, and they could come down and they can't. They obviously can't do anything with it. But there's a chance for they would have done that against New England. There would have been seven points. The the game management to me when I watch the game from coaching standpoint is it really it's not complimentary football. That's been a big issue too. You can't you can't run the game just like okay we're going to run a call offense or defense. You have to manage your offense to your defense, and we're not seeing that. I think it's tough. I man, I hate to give the benefit of the co- of the doubt to new coaches, but um, I think it's got to be tough. There's so much going on those last couple. You the whole game, you're so locked right. in. You're trying to, and then those last three minutes, it's almost like I've always said they should have the 14 year old kid who's obsessed with Madden standing next to them. But that Chargers situation was a perfect example. There, Rivers was mad too because right. they cut. Rivers got mad twice. He yelled at the coach when they called timeout, and then he was screaming at Koo to get off the field before Miami bailed him out with the right. timeout. Right. They would have. They would have had twelve men on the field. Yeah. They would have again to run off and it's done. Right. Then you look at the difference with the Patriots, where Brady. I don't know if it was a good play or not, or he just had so much confidence at the end of the first half where he scrambles. Right. Gets tackled with 14 seconds left. Boom. Goskowski, field goal with two seconds left. I mean, it was almost like he knew, oh, it's fine if I get tackled. It probably wasn't the greatest play, but... But they, but they're so good at that. They practice it. That's yeah. why I think my blue chip list. I'm, I'm convinced of it. There's three really good coaches in the league, and I'm putting Andy Reid in there. And then after that, then there's a whole section of other coaches. Regular season, Andy is. Yeah, is yeah. There's in no the doubt. I mean, four. his game plans have been great. But I think the gap between Belichick, Carroll, and Reid, and the rest of the league is really becoming wider and wider. And I think that's what you're seeing. And these owners, they don't. They want to hire these guys to call plays because it dresses up and it looks good. That's why I like Zimmer. I mean, Zimmer runs the team. He's tough. He tries to match his offense to his defense. It's not happening in, in football. It really hasn't been so far. I like your dude. You called it out. You were telling us he was going to be good, even after they started trading dudes uh, in Buffalo, McDermott. He's a good coach. He's, He's trying. good. That team, both games, They was had a chance involved. to win that game. I mean, if, yeah. if, if, they, if they can complete that pass at the end of the game, I oh, mean, yeah. it was there. They could. I like what he's doing. It's culture. I, I see what they're trying to accomplish. You could see the plan where some of these teams, like I, I hate to pick on my man McAdoo. No, I really don't. But you see no plan. He's just calling plays. He's playing Madden. Meanwhile, the Panth- the, the, the Bills are trying to run a team. Well, especially when you go into the actual season with no running backs, the Giants. Yeah. We're all aware of Paul Perkins at this point. Yeah, I, I mean, I, was I don't t- know what they're looking at when they when they're looking at that one, but it just seems like it's easy to get running backs. And by the way, Deion Lewis is the four string Patriots running back right now. Go get Dan Lewis. He's good. If you can keep him on the field for three months, that's a real guy. Yeah, well, but look, they have institutional problems at the Giants. This isn't just about a player. And I think, you know, the whole game plan last night about not protecting the tackles, to me, it was really bad. I was talking to an NFL, former NFL head coach, and he's like, hey, as long as the Giants keep running those protections, no matter who they put on the field, it will <laughs> right. work. Yeah, they were leaving the left t- that poor left tackle by himself. Because they think oftentimes, and this is what the guy said to me, he said, look, they think they're in Green Bay. And Aaron Rodgers can get out of all the trouble. Whereas yeah. Eli, a good stiff breeze, he's going down. I think the biggest thing I've learned in the first two weeks that I, I'm just – the one thing I've learned as I hit my late forward is, is just admit defeat with things you right. thought going into the season. I would always get stubborn and try to hold on for weeks and weeks. I thought Atlanta was going to have a hangover from that Super Bowl. You made a great point on the podcast, uh, on your podcast on Sunday. It was just like – Atlanta is one of the two teams in the league that can say we're throwing on this down and still complete the pass. Right. And, you know, Devontae Freeman, who I thought was fantastic last year, and, and he's a real yeah. legitimate A-list running back. They know who they are. They're going to be able to score points. That, that doesn't seem like there was a hangover from last year, and I think they're in the top three or four. I, I think would, they are, I and say. I thought there would be a little bit of a decline between what Matt Ryan, he was sensational – with with Kyle yeah, I was with you with Sarkeesian and and, and, uh, and they have they've come out and now they've played you know I mean look they just smoked Green Bay now Green Bay didn't have Mike Daniels in the they game they caught him on a on a right on the right night right and so can they do it again I don't know but this is a good team now they lose Vic Beasley for six to eight weeks so we're going to see how that handles they signed Dwight Freeney back this week that that could help them but I think Atlanta is better on defense they have more team speed and their offense if Julio's healthy they're just really hard to play they're hard to play because they can play left handed and beat you. 
not well, many especially teams inside because yeah. they got uh because they got they're in Detroit this week. That's great for them. It's yeah, they, like, they're in a dome. They're going to be flying. Detroit to me last night was a good team win for Detroit. But if you really dig deeper back, like that game was. I mean, the punt return sealed the game for them. But look, that was the perfect matchup for Detroit. Detroit's defensive ends are good players. Those tackles are bad. The game wasn't going to get away from Detroit. The Giants can't score. So it Odell was. Odell was not 100%. Odell wasn't, Odell wasn't even 50%. Yeah. I don't know what, you know, they're running, you know, it, it's remarkable when you watch the Giants. I mean, they don't run anything down the field. They just, like Gruden said last night, they run slants. They have one, they have one step slants, three steps. That's all they run. Do we think Eli is past his prime or like legitimately maybe done as an, as an above average? Starting I don't think, I, I think the Giants. Are don't know who they are. The Giants should call John Harbaugh up and say, you know what, we are we want to be like you. We're yeah. going to win with defense. What are we? <laughs> We're going to win with defense. We're going to try to run the ball a little bit. We're not going to expose our not quarterback. With those running backs. No, I, not with that offensive line. But yeah. the formula really for the Giants to win is they're going to have to find a way to run the ball and win with defense. Try to win with kicking game because they're not going to outscore anybody. Flacco you know? ball. Flacco ball. I mean, just that's the only way to protect Eli. Eli to wing it down and Do you think around? Eli's going to – you think he's going to withstand those hits that he got last night? He took one last night that it looked like – On the if, completed pass. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> it was a little reminiscent of the helmet catch, but <laughs> yeah. he took a hit. It was like if his feet had been planted for a split second more, I think both of his legs would have broken. He's going to go on the road this week to Philadelphia. How are they going to block that front? They're not going to block Vinnie Curry. They're not going to block Fletcher Cox. They're not going to block all those guys in Philadelphia. It's going to be a hard thing. Now, maybe they can find a way to do it, but – I just think they should change the way they play. They're going to have to figure out. They have no tight end. They have one tight end that can block. When they put Ingram on the field, we talked about this at the draft. He's just a receiver. What do they? What does he do for him, really? I mean, I know he's a big play guy, but what is they don't? He doesn't, well, you, can't you, run you always said when you have somebody like him, where he lines up, you know what the play is going to be. You know exactly what it was. Because he can't block. He can't block it. Gruden was saying it last night on the TV. So I, yeah, I when just, Gruden's calling out your plays, you know you're in trouble because yeah, he, he and, barely does anything when he knows. And Gruden wasn't anymore. backing down on the fact that the guy wasn't a tight end. Yeah, I mean it was part of impressive. I mean he's right, and that's the way I feel about him. It's so, almost like he should be used like Aaron Hernandez used to be used in New England. Right, and that means you're H-back. a twelve team. That means you're a twelve team, and you're moving him around. But he still has to block the backside. And Ellison's got to be. But Ellison is so one dimensional in terms of a blocker, it just becomes too hard. Then you know you want to get the ball to him. So. I would play nickel against the Giants the entire game and blitz Eli and see what he could do. Can, can we officially say Denver's the biggest surprise? Well, Denver's the only team that had two home games. and Sam, Cincinnati and Denver had two home games to start the season. And I think it really helped Denver. Obviously, it helped Denver more in Cincinnati because they were going <laughs> yeah, to. Cincinnati, but, but not helped. But Simeon is going to be a better player at home where the crowd noise is in his favor. And I think when he's healthy, he's a good player. I you think believe he's a, in Simeon. You believe in healthy Simeon. Yeah, I don't believe in 16-game Simeon. I like Simeon. I'm not an anti Simeon. I think Simeon's the perfect middle reliever, can close, but he's not going to be able to close it out. That's the way I see Simeon. So you didn't believe in Eli. You were born out on that one already. Yeah. You believed in healthy Trevor Simeon. Right. You did not believe in Doug Peterson. I still don't. I, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. You don't believe in Jason Garrett. I, I'm, I'm strongly. That was out. I'm strongly. We'll talk about this on GM Street today, but I am strongly like the NFC East. Like if they had, if if there was one blue chip coach in there, they would win the East. Right. We don't have red chip coaches. Or blue Is there chip. green chips? What? What's a what's a shaky chip? Look, I think you know vanilla I mean, maple. Yeah, I mean Jay Gruden comes. You know, I mean he looks like he's the one of the better coaches in the East right now. I was kind of impressed with them in the Rams game. Yeah, they. I, I actually thought he coached a good game in that game. I thought he did too. I thought he did too. I thought the Rams might have been better. The Redskins got the lead, but then they did a couple things as the game went on. They mixed it up on them. They started pounding the ball in the middle, and um, I, I it was think smart. Bill, Bill Callahan being on the Redskins is a difference maker because he's so good as a run game guy. And like they ran counter, they ran a couple runs against the, the, the Rams that were hard to defend. I think Callahan's really makes a difference. I don't see it in Philadelphia. I think Philly, as the season goes on and people start to know exactly what they do offensively, it'll only get worse. Ravens D. 
Ravens D is legit. I, I'm I'm all in on the Ravens. I think the Ravens will be a, the Ravens are going to be a good team. If Flacco doesn't screw it up and Flacco doesn't try to be too much more than he than he could, they're going to play the way Jacksonville wants to play without a quarterback in Baltimore. But but Flacco can make some more. But plays. they actually know how to do it. They know how to do it. It would have been interesting if they played that game over again where there's not the dude deflected passes at the line. Now the Bortles. Doesn't he get a lot of passes deflected anyway? But, but, yeah, Bortles but is... if you don't have those and it's they're able to play like a 10-7, 10-10, 9-7 type game, they're kind of built for that. Once they're down 10, turn it off. Yeah, I mean, it's over. The, I think what, what the Logan Ryan talk about, uh, he talked about how they, 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 they know they don't have a quarterback. Yeah. I mean, so when the other team knows this, I mean, Tennessee walked in there and beat them substantially. I mean, significantly won the game. I mean, it, to me, that's a telling tale. When you lose at home to a team that you play twice a year, that's not good. Can we say the AFC is better than the NFC this year, definitively yet, or no? Well, look, the West is really good. And I mean, the Chargers are 0 2, and I thought the Chargers would compete for a playoff. They should have, and they still might. But it's a classic Chargers season where it's like, they're 1 4, but look out. I mean, I mean, if Marty Schottenheimer coaching the Chargers, yeah. they'd be 2 0 right now. Right. I mean, nothing He's against available. Anthony <laughs> nothing against Anthony Lynn, but I mean, there's some times where the coach just makes some of this, like the whole game plan against Sandy, against Denver was bizarre. And then this two minute drive down the end of the game, I thought they were really going to win. Let Phillip Rivers win the game for you. I think San Diego's talented. They they're, really are. They will be, there's not a lot of talented teams this year. And if they're not one of the 12 playoff teams, that's their fault. They, they, because you look really at the are. AFC, it's like we got the Pats, we have Baltimore, we have Pittsburgh, we have the, potentially three AFC West teams, and then whoever the hell is going to win the AFC South. Yeah, I mean, the, the, somebody's going to be the ad man out. I thought, you know, look. Kansas City is not pretty on defense. They give up yards, but they play really well in the red zone. And then I was at the Raiders game this week, and the Raiders are really good on offense. Raiders, and that was another thing I've already given up on. I, I didn't. I thought they were going to get nudged out of the playoffs, but they're not. They're, they, they have too much talent. No, they, and they, they, when you beat up on a bad team, they beat up on the Jets. That tells me you're a good team. Like yeah. they, did, they, they didn't give the game to the Take Jets. Take care of business game. Exactly. Kansas City has weapons, which I think is a little different for them than usual. They have... Kareem Hunt's just good. I mean, he makes, they had some stat. Danny had some stat in his piece today about how uh, Danny Kelly wrote about the rookie running back boom today, basically. And he was like, Kareem Hunt 38 times when he's, he's basically made 14 of 38 guys miss on like straight up tackles or whatever. He's just good. Yeah. Tyreek Hill, he's out there. You're worried about him the entire time. Kelsey's good. They have real weapons. I mean, I I think it's legit. I don't I don't think this is a oh remember back in September when we thought the Chiefs were going to be good. Like I think this is legit. Yeah, and I thought they would. I thought that Alex Smith would not play this well, but he's played. I thought they would end up going to Mahomes, but they've played way better than Alex Smith has played way better. Couldn't and, you say though he's playing better because he's got weapons? I think he is playing better because he has weapons, and I think they're they're finally they're finally a team that if they have to play left handed, they could win. Because you didn't talk about Kelsey Hill, you know you you can't double everybody, right? Yeah. So you got to have to take your medicine, and they just wore the Eagles down. Their and offensive Hill's going to make one mistake. Hill's gone. It uh -huh. was like the Stephen, the uh, Stephen Gilmore. Um, and McCourty, like not realizing who, right. and all of a sudden Hill's running for 80 yards. Yeah, like yeah, that was a horrible play. But it, look, Conley made a play down the field. I mean, they've got guys that can make plays. And one thing about Smith, he can make play. He can make people miss in the pocket. He got away from the key third down in the game. He scrambles out of it. They had him sacked for sure. He breaks the tackle, runs for first down, and then he's been really accurate down the field. He's been impressively accurate. Maybe they needed a light of fire in him. I tell you what, the way he's playing, I mean, look, he could be like, he, could he be a good play? If he were on the Bills, the way he's playing right now, he right. Would, the Bills probably would be two and zero. I always love your takes on running backs. You you sniff it out. You love you. You always know who the good running backs are. So we have Cook on Minnesota looks right. tremendous. Yeah, he's really good. Hunt looks really good. Fournette, I think, is a battering ram. Right. I think he's legit. The one out of the top four that I, I've been surprised by has not made an impact yet is McCaffrey. Yeah. So what's going on there? Well, I think because McCafferty, you, they right now they're trying to do plays for McCafferty instead of just run the offense for McCafferty. And I think McCafferty has to come in, and it has to be Jonathan Stewart's in the game or McCaffrey's in the game. But when you start running special plays for a guy that everybody knows you're running special plays for, then it becomes Percy problem. Harvin syndrome or Percy Tavon Harvin Austin syndrome. syndrome. Well, ta is there anything? I mean, if I was Aaron Donald and I watched Tavon Austin on Sunday, I would just walked up to the GM of the Rams and said, "That's it, I'm done." <laughs> like, did you? We try to run a jet sweep with him against minus two. Yeah. He goes down with one arm tackles. Like, I can't understand how nobody in LA isn't going berserk over Tavon Austin being the worst player for 14. That's what I get for 14 Nobody million. in LA cares. That's probably I true. I don't even think they know the Rams are here. But, but you know, to me, uh, 
Are we sure Watkins is good? No, I think Watkins is not. I think Watkins looks slower. I mean, he had two catches for 30 yards last week. Is he, he like have a, wide receiver Trent Richardson? And I'm going to riddle you this. Are we sure Des Bryant's good? It's, I was going to ask you if Dallas has a single guy I should be terrified of they don't. 20 the answer yards is down no. the field. The answer is no. The answer is no. Is that part of the problem with Dak? Th- that is part of the problem if with I Dak. Know he, if I know there's nobody that can run past me, it's, it's much easier for now, me to defend Now, here's you. the thing. If, when they run the ball, they are a completely different team because those skill players on the outside, because of play action, because of all the things they do, they're a whole different team. But if you stop their running game, which the the – the Giants have been able to do, and Denver did. The, all of a sudden, they have to win those one-on-one matchups outside, and that's when, I mean, Dez was covered. Like, if you watch the tape, Dez had nowhere to throw the football. Yeah. It was, it was nobody was open. And Dez is not, for $16 million, it's great to have a jump ball receiver in the red zone, but that's I, I need a little bit more than 16 for the 16. This started last year, though. He, 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 he wasn't putting up big I, You would watch entire Cowboy games, and he would just do nothing. looks like he's gotten so big. He yeah. can't. He doesn't have any burst or acceleration or any change of, or any change of speed. Not change of direction. It's change like he doesn't have any gears. Yeah, I. Uh, are you happy with how the Pats have used Cook so far? I think. Or are they Cook, still trying to figure? Here's it out? the thing about Cooks. What I think pa- Patriot fans have to understand is Brady is more comfortable throwing the ball between the numbers. Yeah. So whenever they get a receiver who plays outside the numbers and makes a living outside the numbers, don't think he's going to have seven catches for 140. He's going to have two for 50, or he's going to have one for. Thir- I mean, it's not going to be fe- featured the ball because the ball's coming inside. That's where he makes a living. So they need a threat on the outside. I was actually impressed with Dorsett last week. I thought Dorsett played well. I, you're preaching the choir, brother. I, I couldn't believe it. I yeah. thought it had, with the history of the Pats with speedy receivers that they steal from other teams, it's always gone badly. And this actually, he made a couple of big plays. <laughs> Brady liked him. Brady went up to him at one point and was like doing the helmet to helmet, pat, slam the shoulder pads thing, which was like his kind of. Yeah, sign of approval. And, and I thought, you know, now he's hurt this week. I don't know how badly he'll play if he can play. Everyone's hurt. To me, yeah, every, that's the other problem. But we talk about this whole conversation. Like, how do the Eagles have four soft tissue injuries in a game? Like, how is it possible to yeah. have a hamstring? Like that does that would be like the Cavs or any NBA team having hamstring. They don't get it to start the season. Like, well, I mean, usually if you have soft tissue injuries, it's because you're going out too much. That's exactly the old, right. wives, the old wives tale on soft tissue injuries. It, it, exactly Tate, right. A lot of hamstring pulls. A lot of hamstring Tate. pulls, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, I didn't stretch enough. Okay. Yeah, that's the old. Uh, yeah. Right. I mean, but but we're seeing this. I mean, look at the injuries in week one. Look at all the soft. You can't have soft tissue injuries. They should not happen. Eagles have four, two of them to corners that really affected them. But going back to Sammy Watkins, I don't see a burst in Sammy Watkins. I don't, I don't see a, I don't see an explosive player. Their best player. receiver is Cup, if, and he's an inside receiver. He's good though. He is good. He catches everything, and they do a nice job of featuring I him. Like him. But once Goff has to come off to the set or play faster, then then all of it breaks down. Anybody? Would you cross off Cincinnati and Arizona completely? You know, I, I've been since Arizona. They have no tackles. The, their tackle situation is bad. They make big plays down the field. And Carson Palmer, yeah, I would. I don't see them rallying. I don't think they're good enough on defense to rally. When you go in Indianapolis and struggle to win, you know, I would cross off Cleveland for sure. I would cross off Indianapolis for sure. Would you cross off? Hold on, I'm going through the list. See, I wouldn't cross off the Niners. I wouldn't either because I think the Niners. Look, I thought the Niners, they looked good last week. Now, when Kyle was in Atlanta, he couldn't run the ball on Seattle yeah. last year in the air. They won because Ryan threw the ball effectively. They ran the ball. If their longest pass was 14 yards against the, the the Seahawks, if they don't get better play from Hoyer, but I wouldn't. I'm not going to cross them off yet. Would you cross off the Saints? No, because there's because. Steve comes back. That at least I think now they, you they can outscore people. Sides. Like really, the difference in the Saint Patriot game was the Patriots played better in the red zone. The Saints couldn't score touchdowns. I mean, that was they moved the ball on them. I mean, Breeze was good, and then they when the game got out of hand, they couldn't play catch up. I think they did a bad job of roster management with that team. Who the because Saints? They, they have these, do. the Ingram the Ingram Peterson combo, but then they have this other team going on that they should just be like Breeze should be in the shotgun. They should be airing it out every down. I mean, so it's, Peter- like, it's like it's like they're split personality. Peterson's complaining because they aren't featuring them. They were the only team that wanted them. Right. Like, what's he complaining about? Like, and to be honest with you, talking to people around the league, when they want the Saints to play Peterson, like yeah. everybody wants Peterson in the backfield, right? Because they're one dimensional, and that's all they can do. Would you cross? Is off- he the Dwight Howard of the of the NFL? It's a, Dwight Howard had a better career. 
He oh. really did. Like Dwight Howard was like almost the MVP and like took a team to the finals. What did Peterson do? Peterson won my fantasy team in 2007, <laughs> the title. This is better. Bears, would you cross off? Yeah, I crossed the Bears off. There's no receivers. I don't know how you come back well, from look, that. I mean, look, their first three drives against the against the, uh, against the the Bucks, they went interception, fumble, interception. Like, I, I mean, at what point? And Trubisky, the game's 26 to 0 at the half. Trubisky didn't get in the game. Like, at some point, why don't you put him in the game? The Bears have no chance. No, I would definitely cross the Bears. I would the go Bears. the other way. If they don't have receivers, maybe you don't put them in the game. I don't yeah, know. But, Who's I getting mean, open for him? But he needs reps. I mean, he needs reps. You might as well get him back out there. Okay. Would you cross off? Uh, I had one more. The Jets. Je oh, I crossed the Jets off. Well, the Jets. Well, I'm sorry. Them off. Sorry, Mickey. I'd cross the Jets. I crossed off. them off in June. Would you cross off the Giants? You no, can't the, in that division. You right? can't because they're really good on defense. And I think what you know, they didn't have Jenkins last night. I think they're when you when they play Philly this week, they could win the game. I mean, look, Carson Wentz two more fumbles last week. He had another interception at the end of the half that ended up being a big play for him that yeah. bounced off the receipt. I mean, he's prone to make. And if Doug wants to keep throwing the ball fifty times then teams like the Giants are going to be able to score on them because they're going to benefit from the mistakes the Eagles are making. The Eagles have to go into the game and manage their team. They have a big back. Run the ball. Don't put Wentz in a situation. I don't think situation. the big back touched the ball last week. He, had one, he, had, he caught a ball in the flat for a one-yard catch. That's all I saw. Yeah, I think he, he had, had one he had run. zero fantasy points last yeah, week, no, which I mean, is a problem if you started him because well, getting you know, a zero is bad. It, when you sit in a meeting room on Tuesday, more, Tuesday and say, okay, we're going to go play the Chiefs. What do we have to do? The first thing you say is we can't make this a 50-pass game because if we we try to throw it 50 times, we're going to lose. And that's what the Eagles try to do. I yeah. mean, to me, it's like that's the problem I have. On Tuesday and Wednesday, you have to set up the game plan to give your team a chance to win. And I'm not saying you've got to go establish a run against that team. You don't. You have to give your team a chance to where you can run it enough to keep them off balance or else that crowd noise is going to kill them. I mean, if Wentz couldn't get away from pressure like he does – he be, he got sacked six times in a game. He should have got sacked 12. The left guard for the Eagles, it, I don't know what game Doug was watching, but the left guard couldn't block Chris Jones, okay? He right. couldn't block him, all right? So at some point, you have to say, maybe we should make a change at left guard, okay? I, his, it's a... It's a Hawaiian name. I don't want to butcher it and say it bad because I always do. But anyway, they should have pulled the left guard out. Like, at some point, what game are you watching? Now, if you're McAdoo and you're making checks all the time, then I understand that. Okay, I'm working on my craw crossword puzzle during the game. But if I'm watching a game <laughs> and there's a left left guard that can't block the guy, I got to change the guy. Yeah. At some point, why don't you do that? That's what drives me crazy. Have you seen enough from Pittsburgh to feel like they're Pittsburgh again? Or is no, there anything they're not worrying Pittsburgh you? Yet. They're not I don't Pittsburgh. feel like they're Pittsburgh, they're not yet, Pittsburgh yet They've won two I'm games. I'm not crossing them off. They're a top no, 10 team. Uh, they've won two games and it hasn't been... They fought to win two games. I mean, that, that Browns game, they blocked the kick for a touchdown. They struggled to move the ball. And they started talking about how good the Browns were on defense. Yeah, okay. And then the Ravens went ahead and just ran it down their throat. Right. So wait a minute, time out. Settle down. Last question. Um, Malcolm Butler... Is he at the stage of his Patriots career? If he's Billy Bats, is he at the bar? There's like a lot of people in the bar, or is it there's just five people left and now he should be really concerned? I think that tape on Sunday, the Patriots Saints tape, was about who's been practicing and playing well and who hasn't. And Malcolm hasn't been practicing or playing well. I've seen this play before. Right. Alan Branch hasn't been practicing I've been play. to this production. This is all... Oh, wait. You have a contract. You want a big contract and you're in the last year and you're not playing that well and maybe your head's not totally in it. You're gone. Yeah, I mean... He's going to get traded. I don't know if he will because here's why. It's hard if they don't have a third corner. Rowe, they have Rowe, they have Gilmore. Who's the third corner? Joseph what about Jones. Jones played well. He made that one play in the back. But I think Belichick cares. He's all about like who's buying in this year. I think he's I think they're trying to get him turned around. So he, they have it. So at this point, does Belichick take Malcolm Butler? Does he have the one on one meeting and be like, hey dude? I think Malcolm needs. To, I think the volume of what Malcolm does needs to get reduced, and maybe having him play this role reduces the volume and helps him out. I tell you, the other guy that would be if they had a better left tackle. Nate Solder hasn't played well all season. Hmm. In the first two games, Nate hasn't played particularly well. Now he missed all of camp, but there, I think that game was a reflection of, hey, fellas, the guys who earn the right to play have to practice and play well. And you could see, because I always go on Patriots.com and watch the locker room video after, because I'm a loser. Yeah. And uh, 
you know, and they got the Robert Brady Kraft, show. Kraft and Kraft, <laughs> yeah. he's shaking hands, and Brady you comes in. You think that in. cameraman was told to focus yes. on Kraft? <laughs> Start out with the Krafts. Brady <laughs> says his things, and then uh, Belichick gives his little speech. And it's basically the same speech every week, but you can kind of tell how he felt about the previous week from that right. week's speech. And he was like, hey, that's the recipe. You know, we got a lot of work left. This has got to be an all week thing. That's what we did this week. Every day leads to Sunday. It's a, what we do during the week. He gave one of those. So it was clear like he felt like yeah. before that KC game that people weren't as focused I, I think, heading into it. I think the whole thing for him is stringing together three or four good practices in a row. And I don't think they had done that prior to the Kansas City game. And so now the last week, that's the recipe. And then then using that as a backdrop, he'll keep he'll keep telling the team what they need to do. And if Malcolm doesn't play well, he won't play. I was getting emails that... Uh, from Eagles fans, that Butler for Kendrick, that guy Kendrick on oh the Eagles, yeah the, the pass rusher. No, he's a linebacker. Or he line, plays he's inside like a linebacker. Line, played and, really good last okay. week against Kansas City. I don't know City. Who that. I don't Michael Kendrick. Michael he, Kendricks. You know he makes a lot of money, and I think the I think the Patriots have done their homework on him, and I don't think they're interested. Okay. But you think Butler's going to get traded? No, I don't. No, I don't. <laughs> who do you think Butler's going to get traded to? <laughs> Tate Frazier. <laughs> to the rigor. <laughs> yeah. I I'm think, very worried for Malcolm Butler. I think they need Malcolm Butler. I like to be my a good Super Bowl player. hero, Malcolm Butler. I want him to stay in the I Patriots. I want to ring for Malcolm, but I think they need they need Malcolm to play at a higher level. Okay. And so does Malcolm Butler. What's my panic button for Gronk this week? Well, he says he's okay on the groin. I don't know what to It'd say. It'd be nice if if 75% of the time he got tackled, it didn't lead to an injury. Yeah, that would be really good. I it mean, just seems like every time he goes down with two guys on him now, he's slow to get up, something happens. It, and he's he's like double the size of the guy tackled him, too. I, it's ridiculous. It's, I don't there know might what, just be too much I, wear like and tear. To know, I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall in the Saints team room. And I was worried about Gronk. But they have this rookie, 47, from the University of Florida. I think they drafted him in the third round. Like, At what point do you say, you know, we should put him on Gronk? Like, right. what, like, when does that make any sense to you? Oh, well, we have Kenny Vaccaro. We'll put him on. Then we'll put the, like at some point. No, that's let's your just red chipper them. coach, Sean Payton. Just yeah. give up. Just retire it. It happened to Jeff Fisher. Coaches lose it. It yeah. happens. I think sometimes that you're right. Money spoils all of us. I watch Goodfellas on Friday night. <laughs> I want to talk about that after we finish the podcast. <laughs> Guess what? It's still a phenomenal movie. It, it's, it's just loaded. It's, it's so good. It is so phenomenally good. You can watch it repeatedly and still find something in it. I, that you, I found like 20 things. Yeah, it's 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 like I don't even yeah. know how. I would like to have a copy of the original draft to the final draft of that. Because Do you know the, who he lost the Best Director Oscar to? No. Kevin Costner for Dances with Wolves. Really? <laughs> yeah. Scorsese lost the Oscar. When you watch this movie now, I, de I defy anybody to watch Dances with Wolves on cable and compare the two and, and tell me how. I will be the how. first to admit I've never seen Dancing with Wolves. It's... It's it's definitely not uh, as well directed. Are you watching The Deuce too? Have of you, course. Is it good? It's good. A lot of dicks. Should be very, <laughs> some, some dicks flying left and right. All right, I just have to be, get on Just that. get ready mentally for it. Mike Lombardi, um, Jam Street on the on the Ringer NFL show, and then we've been putting videos up, yep. and then on Fridays. We're messing around with uh, Instagram stories, which I really liked what we did this week, where you're just throwing out Friday opinions on various things. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, we're your multimedia. We're turning into a multimedia. I, hope so. I like uh, it. An asset. I like it. This is when Goodfellas, when they, when, when, who is Paul Servino's character? Oh, the boss. Uh, what the heck's his Pauly? name? Paulie. Paulie. Yeah, Paulie. When he didn't embrace cocaine. <laughs> yeah. His business really fell behind. This is our cocaine Instagram. You got to embrace all the I'm new stuff. I'm all for it. It's I, great. Like, I'm all you for it. You got to get there. I don't Instagram understand stories. it, but I'm all for it. <laughs> we, just, we just tape it and put it up. You don't I don't care what we do. I love right. it. Mike Lombardi, thank you. All right. Thanks to Lombardi. Thanks to Nathan Fielder. Thanks to Gillette. I mentioned this earlier. It's a Gillette razor blade is thinner than a single brain cell. That's a product of many brain cells at work, namely the thousands of men and women at Gillette, always working harder to make your shave better. And now you can get Gillette blades for less at GilletteOnDemand.com. Gillette, the best a man can get. Pricing applies to select products and is at the sole discretion of the retailer. Thanks also to Hotel Tonight, the app that helps you find amazing hotel deals up to seven days in advance, perfect for an unexpected trip or spontaneous staycation. Play it by ear knowing you have the freedom to grab a great place and price. 
All it takes is 10 seconds, just three taps and a swipe. Grab killer last minute deals by downloading the Hotel Tonight app right now. Don't forget about the ringer.com. You can find my football column there every Friday. Don't forget about the Ringer Podcast Network. Don't forget about the ringer.com. We are back on Friday with a celebrity. You might have seen his picture on my Instagram, but he's who's coming up on Friday. Until then.